Hey, welcome to Guitar Knobs, the guitars, gear, noise, and nonsense podcast hosted today by these knobs. Tony Dudzik, Pick Guardian. Jared Brandon, Brandon Wong Pickups. Hey, it's me, Todd Novak. Glad to have you with us. I am very excited to be here talking into the microphone to everyone out there. Um, stop making gestures at me, Tony. Hey, we got somebody on the line. All right. Kevin Equitz of Equitz Guitars. Ray, for this, I am excited. Kevin, you make some fine guitars, my man. Absolutely. Oh, thank you so much. You are welcome. Uh, we're going to get into his fine guitar making and all of the things that, uh, that tickle his toenails when it comes to guitars and influence and all that business in our main interview today. Uh, we've got a couple things that we, you know, as per use, need to, need to cruise through really quick. Uh, I want to make a special request. We just opened up our YouTube page for the world. And right now it is all episodes. So you can listen to our full episodes, the entire library on YouTube under the Guitar Knobs podcast. And I think if you go there and you subscribe, I'll be super happy. Yeah. And even if you like a few, I wouldn't be pissed about that either. Oh, and, and if you put in the guitar knobs, you know, we don't come up right away because we just got on. But don't worry. Scroll just a little bit and you'll see the, the old familiar logo. Also, we have loads of people listening all over the world. Um, and I'm not saying that. I'm not making up. That's actual factual stuff. And I would very much like to hear from you. I, we get comments from people all over the United States, of course, um, and also uh, in, in a few other countries, which is great. But I know there's a lot more people in a lot more countries, and I really do want to hear from you. So even if it's just to say, hi, I'm here, like, like Horton hears a who, I'm, I'll be Horton. If you go on the social and you scroll down, you'll see a lot of the, the country colored uh, flag pictures that you make. Grieve. <laughs> I had to clear my throat, and I was trying to get it all out before I cleared it. So. Nicely you know, done. Go on the uh, social and scroll down, and you'll you'll see the the uh, the flags that Tony or that I'm sorry that Todd yeah, I got John on, Todd Tony <laughs> Tony Todd Todd Tony Tony right. Todd Todd. Anyway, yeah, it's a good time. Yeah, man, get involved on the social people. Yeah, we love it. We love it. Uh. All right, so that's it. Let's just go. Oh, all right, Tony. <clears throat> Here it is. The other day, <laughs> I was chatting with um, a fairly well-known guitarist that I know mm -hmm. who has listened to. Should I go take a bathroom break right now? No, no, no. no. <laughs> okay. no you'll, you'll want to hear this. Okay. Don't Excellent. interrupt him anymore. I want to hear I this. Okay. Please. I'm, I'm just setting the scene here. All right. Candlelight, talking, chatting. Very nice. Very comfortable. Kevin, if you need to take a bathroom break, that might be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so we're chatting, and, um, and, and, and this uh, near celebrity, I cannot mention, due to... You mean near you or almost a celebrity? Uh, both. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, said, you know, I've listened to a couple of the episodes, and I really... Dig, and that was that's the word in quotation marks. I'll mm -hmm. use quotation marks. Dig what you're doing. Nice. I said, you know, it's funny you should mention that because we've got a great way that people like you <laughs> and other people who aren't near celebrities mm -hmm. or near me could help out. And it's this little thing called Patreon. It's super, super simple, as I explained. You go to patreon.com forward slash the guitar knobs and you can donate money to help broadcasts, podcasts, if you will. You get stuff like this happen. Yeah. You get stuff, different levels. And Jared, what is it that people also get? Well, if you if you're an executive producer, you get your name said on the thing. Wow. You get your name said on the thing. Right. So just imagine your name being said on the thing. On the, on the guitar. Now. So oh, anyhow, yeah. you know, it, we take all, there's all levels. You can go there and explore on Patreon. Do what you can. It lets us know that you appreciate us, the things that we do. We really enjoy doing this. Slick. 
What's that? Was it Earl Slick? I'm not telling. It was Earl Slick, tell. wasn't it? I don't know. I can't tell. I, I cannot reveal all my sources. So anyhow, <laughs> help as you can. Get some really cool stuff, uh, different levels. Yeah. Get your name read on the thing. And it's really cool. And mm-hmm. it lets us know you are listening and love what we're doing. Again, that's patreon.com forward slash the guitar, the guitar knobs. And uh, I'm starting to memorize the names that are read every every episode, and too. So. Is that your, you got you using your flannel like a little blankie right now? Is that it kind of looks like one, too? <laughs> I like it. It <laughs> makes me feel comfortable. Uh, if. I have gotten a lot of comments on your on the latest episode. Uh, I did the the na 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 boo boo song. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, hilarious! Kevin, are you still there, my friend? Yes, sir. Oh, thank goodness. All right, yeah, Tony, giving up yet? Tony, good job, buddy. <laughs> thank you. I tried to keep it brief and yet yes, personal. Keep your briefs on. I liked it. All right, what are we doing in the world today? In the guitar world, in the world of guitar, Kevin, <sighs> let's hear from you, man. Sure. Well, my uh, projects are in batches. So right now I'm working on four guitars and uh, they're all in the finish stage. So I've been doing a lot of wet sanding right now. After the wet sanding, I hit it. Um, one more final coat and then buff them out. Go on to assembly. Nice. Let me ask you this. Have you ever launched a guitar on a buffer? Um, if I had a pedestal buffer, it probably would happen. Yeah. But uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> It's quite a feeling. I, I, yeah, <laughs> I, I feel like should, I, I think if nothing else, you should buy a pedestal buffer just That's for f- that. Yeah. yeah. Somebody once called it a uh, a rapid guitar relocation device. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Uh, That's uh, hilarious. And and for those who don't know what a pedestal buffer is, and they're about to, you know, like imagine the car. In imagine front of you. We, buffing wheels on the outside of this. It's a motor. pole. It's a pole with a motor and two spinning wheels all right excellent that's cool new guitars coming out dig it all different models or are they um um or do you do you do do you batch uh two of a two of one model and then yeah a couple of different ones beyond that cool. yeah while you're while we're still on that topic and we don't want to give away the farm right now sure I'm really sure where that comes from i love etym- et- etymology i'm gonna have to look that up later um <laughs> Do you, I'm curious when people do guitars and they're like, I'm going to do one of each model in red. Is that how they do it? You know what I mean? Or is it, I'm going to do one of each model in three different colors? Like, is there an efficiency to be found there? I'm not really sure. Well, if your paint gun's loaded. Yeah. <laughs> it's I guess a lot so. easier to do one yeah. color. Right? I guess these ones are all <laughs> plaid today. That's a good point. <laughs> they're all shy. They yeah. might have multiple paint guns, though. Well, that's true. Yeah, it probably, probably. Jared, what are you doing? Well, <clears throat> two weeks ago, we went to Chicago. We went to that guitar show, um, guitar thing, the swap. And uh, a good buddy of mine that was a table next to me named Todd uh, t- told me, Jared, you got to get one of those pedal boards over there. Oh, my gosh, it's a steal. I'm like, oh, yeah, well. And then you were like. Reluctant. What are, what are you talking about? Get the get the thing. It's it's inexpensive. It's are you crazy if you don't? So I got the pedal board. And, and I, will, I will let me interrupt just briefly because Todd does truly enjoy spending other people's money. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. Well, you know what? I I took a chance. Is yeah, what the hell? Anyway, I I, uh, I bought the pedal board, and right now I'm trying to decide exactly what pedals I want on this thing. Mm-hmm. And then that's I'll, a giant. That was a giant pedal board, as it's I remember. pretty day gone big. They would hold that Morley and one other probably. That's why yeah. I told him. So I got several amps in my basement, and a f- some of them have pedals for it's the a, amps. It's a temple board, by the way. Like just so we can clarify, it's a temple board, and it was. It's uh, I think it's a thirty inch. Yeah, it's, it's big. It's, huge. it's big. Fifty bucks. Whoosh. Yeah, my uh, my friends came over the other day and said. What'd you give for this? I said fifty bucks. What? That's a steal. So you're really good about it, man. So thank you, thank you, Todd. You're welcome. Uh, I try to help people out. So I'm I'm trying to figure out exactly what pedals I want to put on this thing. So how about I'll, all of your pedals? Because <laughs> they'll fit. The small ones, yeah. But maybe you should get an amp board, right? Well, 
all these pedals, I have all these other pedals that are to my amps. And like, do I put those on the board? I should probably end up selling you my uh, my one spot seven too. Oh, you got the twelve, didn't you? Yeah. Oh, I got never 20. mind. Okay. So yeah, one of these days I'll have Todd over at the place and or Tony or whoever. Probably Todd because he's a pedal. You're a pedal maniac, man. I love him. I'll help you, I, or I'll help I'll you it. help me set this thing up, man. Yeah, man. We're looking forward to it. I think that. I'm going to come over next week. Excellent. Awesome. Good news. Tony. I am here. Yes. What have you been up to this week, my friend? Well, this week was, um, it was interesting. We uh, we had to go up to Kalamazoo, Michigan. You have visions of Paul Harvey dancing in your head, don't you? All the time. Page <laughs> two. We went up, uh, it was under, we, we had to go, we had, didn't have to go. We Easy went for you to, to say. We went to uh, a friend of ours memorial service in Kalamazoo. Uh-oh. So while we were there, I said, you know, I'm going to um, check out what's left of the Gibson factory. Part of it is now Heritage Guitars. And I was somewhat dismayed, but enticed by the concept. Um, I was looking for a of giant. Heritage Guitars? No, no. Oh, just the factory. Yeah. Um, the the landmark was this seventy foot smokestack that said Gibson right. in white bricks on the way down. Right. Well, when I got to uh, the factory on Parsons seconds. Street, um, <laughs> it just said O N. <laughs> right. So I said it was well, just years ago they took that down, right? Well, uh, uh, maybe a year ago. Yeah. So, so the story goes. Um, there's uh, the landlord that owns that property was concerned that the thing was going to topple over. Yeah. And uh, they were just going to tear it down. Well, another group got uh, together, and it was called Save the Stack Kalamazoo.com, and they're actually raising money to rebuild. First, they had to take it down, and then they're rebuilding the smokestack again. Did they actually raise that money? Um, I think they're probably better than halfway there. I did mm. check it out there. They really didn't say where their what their progress is. Mm. They had enough to put the O and the N on. I tell you what, <laughs> um, I am a bricklayer by trade. I would love to go up there and ask him if I can lay a couple brick on that stack. That would be pretty cool. Yeah, I just I I'm curious. Like, I get it. Like it says Gibson, right? right. But now it's the heritage place. Correct. And Gibson is now leaving their Memphis home. Yes. So I'm just curious. I'm not knocking anybody's uh, sentiment sentimentality. I am a very I'm a sentimental fool. But it'd be cheaper. But I'm trying to figure out like that's a lot of money to put up to re erect a monument to a company that left. Yeah. I don't yeah. understand. But, that and personally. I totally get that. And, and when, when you texted me that, I, yeah. I said, you know that. That really does kind of make sense. Uh, it's not a knock on anybody's, like, I, I get it. Like, I get why people want things around. I really do. I'm just trying to sort it out but in my head. Cheap, it's cheaper to say, you know, I have to say Gibson than Heritage. Well, well the other thing that really disappointed me, in addition to only seeing an O and an N on the smokestack, right. is the building itself is in just horrible condition. I yeah. mean, broken windows and, you know, there's so much history in that you know that happened there i mean that gibson moved there in the early 1900s probably turn of the yep. century and it you know ran it really through the 80s yep and and now it's 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 sad that it's that way now hopefully they'll be able to do something heritage has been there for i guess since gibson left yeah. i we just saw a heritage for the first time i have saw a heritage for the first time uh at the at the gear swap oh yeah a woman came up and wanted to Wanted to. She, oh yeah, the Les Pauly one. Yeah, so she brought that up and showed it to us, and it was a super nice guitar. They're 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 great instruments. Yeah, I've Man, seen. I one saw an ES three thirty five style Heritage at a, a wedding I went to. Yeah, um, <clears throat> Kevin, have you playing. seen? Have you handled any equitzes or anything? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> every day <laughs> he makes them. <laughs> Never touched one. No, I don't know. I hear, I hear they're okay. Yeah, have you handled any heritages? This is um, nothing that rings a bell. No. Okay. I might have. I've I've played a couple. Uh, they're a Les Paul one, similar yeah. to that. Uh, some of the jazz boxes that they make are just incredible. Yeah. I mean, aside from the pickguard and the name, 
they're pretty much dead it is on. one of those kind of things where you pick it up and you're like this is a really well made thing yeah like uh, if you like it or not you can at least say that i mean i love the fact that i i own i think around four or more guitars that are from the kalamazoo factory yeah that's cool so there you go so that was my week i mean i'm, I'm in addition to other things, but that was last weekend actually, uh -huh. and it was interesting. And right. I and I hope that they get the smokestack rebuilt so that the next time I go to Kalamazoo, I can see a full stack. Right. That's right. Okay. All I right. Wanna, I want to lay some brick on it. Okay. Let well, me keep us updated on that. Uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> How about with you, Todd? What's been going on? I messed around with the exotic EP booster that Ooh. I've always wanted to try and tony had one laying around i was at a shop and i said ooh, ooh, ooh let me try that out holy bit flamma flammel <laughs> there it is wow man i i could not believe how much power was in that little tiny pedal it's crazy i thought it was just gonna like boost the signal a little bit to give it some hair i kid you not it added five or six ticks on on the dial like i had my amp set at at two okay I had I turned on the uh, pedal and just for fun, you know, I, I dimed it, <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I you know, always have dang near like, dang, yeah. I mean, it, it, it was like it was like Marty from from right. Back to the Future. I right. could not believe how much power that added to my amp. <laughs> so I was like, when on earth would I need this pedal? <laughs> But All then the I time. realized, then I, you know, then I started adjusting things. I was like, okay, cool. The, the thing that everybody says about that pedal is it adds a certain something. It isn't just more power. And, it, and I believe that is true. Well, yeah, I mean, it, I like it. If you do it at unity gain, so, you know, basically the signal going in, signal coming out is about the same level. It's Which is still, actually, it's like at almost nothing if you do that. Yeah, it's probably at... Seven or three, seven, maybe. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just just barely up. Yeah, um, it do, it just does some really nice stuff. Yeah, and it, it, it just, did it did add a, an extra dynamic, which I really did like. Um, it, you know what it's like? It's almost it's almost like um a, an EQ, just a, a slight enhancement on your EQ. Yeah, that's what I found it to be. Well, um, I mean, it's supposedly based on the circuitry of of an old Echoplex. Echoplex, right. And, you know, there's a lot of the players. The old ones, not like, the new ones. Yeah. Well, actually, you know, it's interesting. We were talking about that last week. Mm -hmm. And the most sought-after Echoplexes are actually the solid-state ones, not the tube ones. Interesting. And uh, because the solid-state ones actually sound better. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, As a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, yeah, that was my week. And I had a lot of fun making a bunch of racket. And I have the pedal in the bag to show you. Uh, one, two, one, two, three, four on the floor. Kevin, are you ready? Yes, sir. Let's do it. Okay, so um, the first one, and granted, keep in mind here that, you know, all this time I've been a guitar guy. So the pedal thing is a little new to me, honestly. Um, for a long time, I was kind of a plug straight in type of person, but... Um, through building guitars, I've been able to make um, some really good friends that um, are also pedal builders, and I've gotten some as gifts from other people. So, yeah, I'm slowly building a, a collection over here, and it's it's been kind of fun. I'm having a good time. So if I had to narrow it down, which is really difficult, um, but if, if I had to narrow it down to most essential, the first one that I would start with, and, and this is, you know, we're assuming tuner, you know, do a headstock or whatever, like, you know. I'm yeah, not say tuner, tuner, pedal tuner aside, first. what do you got? Yeah, yeah, come on. That's like the coefficient one. It's right. just understood. Right. Um, so the first one I would say is it was a collaboration, um, a Pelican Noise Works with um, uh, another podcast, 60 Cycle Hum. And it's a um, it's a dual drive. It's it's essentially like the, the DOD 250 preamp, um, but stacked. Side by side. So yep. it's a dual pedal. They call it the 5050. And the, the art on it um, is kind of modeled after the, the 5050 um, ice cream bar. Yeah. Which and, also uh, looks so, like a certain podcast that I'm aware of. Hmm. <laughs> there's, a, there's an orange theme there. Yeah. <laughs> um, hmm. Halloween colors. Yeah. Also, the pedal show has a very similar colored one as well. Hmm. Well, I'll be a blue nose go. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what that means. Go ahead. <laughs> um, but, uh, so Leon from Pelican Noiseworks, he's a friend of mine. We've been, um, doing some cool collaborations, which I'll, I'll mention on the next pedal. 
But this one was was cool uh, for me because, um, like I said, being mostly kind of just an amp person, it's nice having the stages of drive. So you can set one of them kind of light and then you can set the other one to be you know heavy and you could turn them both on. Um, so it's great. There are uh, like light and dark kind of settings for each of them. And um, it's just it's a real simple pedal. Like for me, simple is great. I don't need like a ton of switches and a ton of dials to to really, you know, tune things in. Right. Uh, it's it's enough to like you know even remember to change pickups as far as i'm concerned so <laughs> the the less i need to think about with the pedals is great so it's i kind of have it set up just like you know gears like some dirt more dirt and then you click them both on and it's a lot of dirt so right uh, that's been a lot of fun and that's that's like a real like um definite go-to for me uh the next one is also from pelican noise works and uh are you all familiar with the pelotar oh yeah Okay, so um, he and myself and another friend of ours, we had collaborated on a project of um, building a, a guitar with the fuzz circuit built into it. Um, you know, other companies had done it in the past, and but we just thought it would be it'd be fun to have a Pelican Noise Works fuzz circuit, mm -hmm. you know, built into the guitar. And so he took half of his Pelotar and um, basically made a prototype pedal out of it for this project. And he ended up really liking that prototype pedal, and um, released it as what's called the half horse, and uh, as in half of the Pelotar. Mm -hmm. So it is a really great fuzz pedal. It's got one big gigantic knob um, for the gain control which on the pedal is listed as grain. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's got a lot of range in the fuzz and fuzz is another thing that's been fairly new to me. So it's nice as it, it has a good spectrum from like that real kind of gated sound to the big, full, rich, you know, yeah. classic fuzz. And, uh, so that's been a lot of fun for me too. I feel like people are either reverb guys or fuzz guys. I don't feel like they're both. I could be wrong. I'm that's probably wrong, but well, Oh, go ahead. I, that's just, I feel like that's an observation that I've been sort of collecting as of late, except for the guys who are building them, obviously. But, it, you this, know, it's, it's just an interesting it. thing. For sure. And, you know, quite honestly, the, the reverb, like, um, my amp is a Blues Junior, um, mostly because of the reverb and, you know, it's a low watt, just simple amp. And um, so when I started playing electric guitar, I was all about like instrumental surf music and you know, some rockabilly and stuff like that. So good reverb is, uh, essential. And, and so I really like the reverb on the amp. Um, and, so and you, you put that in, in the, uh, uh, hang on a second. I'm trying mm -hmm. to, uh, that was in the Rayburn, right? You put that in the Rayburn guitar. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And that's two of the the four guitars that I mentioned are um, two more of those fuzz Rayburns. We're doing a, just a limited run. We're going to do seven of them. That's really cool. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Dimel, uh, Frank Dimel in Germany. Um, mm -hmm. He has a circuit that he's developed, a proprietary circuit that mimics a Leslie amp, uh, Leslie uh, speaker cabinet right. in the guitar, which is flipping cool, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's really what it is. You know, it's it's about, you know, just kind of having something there for fun. Yeah. Um, when we when we started throwing the idea around, because you know Vox, uh, it had been done before. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean there's loads of guitars circuit. with stuff in there, yeah. And so when we were talking about it, originally, it's my friend Coach Schneider and I, we were talking about it, and um, he's the one who kind of brought Leon into the project because you know in my mind it was like, but well, we got to make sure that it's a really really good fuzz. This can't just be a gimmick. Like it's got to be yeah. useful uh, effect. And, and it is. I mean, that guitar is so much fun to play. Um, and it's <laughs> we were having a lot of fun. We were at an amp show. And so we were demoing amps. And, um, you know, without telling anybody, we, we were trying to <laughs> clean. I think we would flip that fuzz switch over and everyone would get very confused. Um, but we got a lot of compliments on it. It's, it's a lot of fun. And it's it's a useful circuit just on its own. So that's why I like having it as a pedal as well if I'm not playing it on the, you know, a fuzz guitar. That's cool. I like that. Yeah. I'd like to I'd like to hear the pedal, actually. It's super cool. The artwork is a lot of fun too. Um, yeah. So anyway, yeah, you'll have to check it out. It's it's a trip. Nice. Uh, number three would be, um, and this is a new one. It's the uh, the Walrus. Um, was it ARP eighty seven? So it's a uh, it's a delay with the. It's got four different uh, types of delay on it. So you got your digital, your analog, your lo fi, and a slapback. In uh, 
for my purposes, I really like the lo-fi. I probably switch back and forth between the um, the analog and the lo-fi delay, but it's it's got this cool little modulation effect. Um, the, it's, it's got the tap tempo. I mean, and, and you know, for like what I was saying before, it's just it's easy to navigate. It's, it's easy to use. It does you know exactly what I'm looking for, and and I really enjoy it. Um, and it looks cool too. Which it is, is a cool looking pedal, and it's got a lot of knobs, which is fun. <laughs> right. The the other ones, I just kind of leave them alone because, you know, I'll, I'll get lost. But um, right. yeah, you know, for the switches and, you know, it's it's very useful. Yeah. Cool. And then the last one would actually be probably the first pedal that I bought for myself a long time ago. Um, and then I didn't really buy any more just because it was it was great. But it's the uh, Dan Electro Dan Echo. So Getting even a though the nod from Tony on this one, yeah, that's a oh, fun pedal. Cool. Right. So even though the um, the ARP does a slap back, I like to use the ARP for, you know, like longer trailing kind of delays um, because it's got the tempo on it. But having the Dan Echo um, as a slap back, it's got that kind of a tape delay slap back. It's so much fun. And, um, you know, so there's a nostalgia thing because I've had it forever. It's a gigantic you know, heavy. Yeah. <laughs> it's about, it's about really that big. Is this the, is this the, uh, it's turquoise colored one. It's like a lavender kind of a light purple. Okay. Yeah. They so made that, it look kind of like an echoplex. It doesn't thing. look that big. I'm looking at what it, uh, at a picture of two. One is the Dan Electro real echo, which is a, an actual huge. tape. Oh yeah. Yeah. Know? Yeah. No, this is, this is a non tape version. Yeah. So this is the, yeah, it is lavender, but it doesn't look big. And those pedals are usually pretty small. So I'm very confused right now. It's not, I, I mean, I shouldn't say it's like super huge, but it just compared to what we're used to with the standard like rectangular enclosures that yeah. fit next it's, to each yeah, other. Yeah, it's at least port. a double box. Okay. It's got like an odd footprint. And, yeah. Um, so this was I, probably before the days of the big pedal boards and all this kind of stuff. And, right. I mean, this is when I was just getting into it. So all I had was that. I would just plug that into my uh, my Blues Junior and I was I was happy. So yeah, that would uh, that would be my four on the floor. Nice. Nice. Here it is. That's a, that's a, uh. A, a colorful board. I don't mean. <laughs> I don't necessarily mean visually, but it's well, just a lot of uh, the Dano pedal is, is visually. Yeah, you got an orange pedal, a, pur- a purple pedal, a black pedal, and a, <laughs> uh, what is it? White? Wait. Anyways, it, it matters not. That's a good. That's a good board. I support what, that. What board. color would it be if you took all the colors and mixed Brown. them all together? I'll, Gray. Uh, yeah. Dark, dark, muddy black. <laughs> okay. Cool. Well, thanks for sharing that with us, man. Sure. Let's talk right now about why the heck you're on the show. Yeah. Uh, your guitar has obviously caught our eyes, so we said, hmm, let's check this stuff out. That's why you're here. And cool. And you make good stuff from, from everything I understand. In all transparency, I have not actually played your guitars. That's fair. Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I don't know, how, how many about do you do a year, you think? Uh, I average about five to six. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's probably why I, you know. yeah. <laughs> um, just send one here real quick. Yeah. No, yeah. don't do that. It'll get messed up in the mail and then, then Jared can't pay for it. So, oh, buddy. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it, I, we really were taken by your, uh, you, you said that, you know, simple is a big thing with you and right. I think you've, you obviously have that, that carries over in your design. So, we would just want to hear a little bit about how you got started. Uh, we don't need to go into like, you know, I was, I was born and you yeah. know, don't have to go that far, but what, just tell me real quick, the first time you heard or, or you got kind of hooked on like, Oh, that's a guitar sound. Well, do you remember what that was? Yeah, actually. Um, as a, a child during the, uh, the early eighties, um, guitars were bright colored they were pointy you know they were these cool like space age weapon looking you know things and and the music videos and the fog machines and the, you know yeah, it, yeah the electric guitar was just so darn cool i mean it's always been cool but you know in that era for me it was it was fascinating and um for whatever reason there was this one obscure store um in this uh, local mall and uh, it must have been a consignment store or a pawn shop or i don't know but i was i was really young but i remember um, whenever we went past it, I'd, I'd, I'd beg my mom to, to let me go in there and, and just look at all the guitars on the walls. And, um, yeah, there was something about it just fascinated me. And at one time, cause you know, I knew 
I wasn't allowed to touch them. But one time no one was looking and I dragged my finger across the strings of one of them, hoping it would just go, you know, like I pictured. <laughs> and it was just this like sterile, just bring you know, like yeah. nothing. And, um, you know, so that, that was, that kind of started it. But, uh, you know, I think my fascination of them was really rooted in coming from a very musical family. So my, um, you know, my dad's a drummer. My brother is a, he's a guitar player. So he's, he's a little bit older than me. So he got into guitar first, um, when he was in like junior high or so. So that was, um, that was part of our family was playing music and, and just enjoying music. My uh, parents took us to lots of concerts and, um, so that was our thing. And so, um, my dad has guitars too. My, my brother has guitars and, and changing strings, you know, doing that kind of stuff was really fun for me. Um, it was kind of a chore, um, to them, I guess, but I, I really enjoyed the, you know, the maintenance and the, the process. And, you know, I, I've done a few little things like placing the tuners on one of them and all that. So by the time I hit college, I was studying art, and, um, you know, I was really into music and, and all this kind of stuff. And, and there was this one moment in a class where, um, we had to talk about like our, our artist statement, you know, and of course I hadn't prepared for any of this at all. I was just winging it. And, um, the moment hit me like right before I had to go up and, you know, present to the class, my, you know, <laughs> my vision as an artist, you know, um, I just said, you know, I just build guitars. I like art. I like music and, uh, why not? And so I told the whole class that that was what I was going to do. And the response was really positive. People, you know, thought that was kind of cool. And so coming out of that class that day, I was like, well, OK, maybe that's something worth checking out. So you did so, it for the girls. <laughs> not so much. I mean, at the time, at the time, uh, you know, I was, I was dating who's now my wife. In, and um, so I had a I had a full time job. You know, I knew that as soon as I was done with school, I wanted to get married. So um, that was kind of a delay. You know, like we were just kind of getting set up that way. So for those years um, in between, I was doing a lot of research on how guitars were made and, um, you know, trying to, to kind of plan my next steps. Uh, we didn't have a lot of space, didn't have really the money to work with. So, you know, I was just forced to kind of dream about it for a while. And, um, so, you know, fast forward, I, I started with a parts caster, you know, that I just assembled. It was a strat that I assembled from modular pieces, which, you know, I think is a testament to the design of a Stratocaster, you know, all the, the hardware, the body, the neck, they all came from different places. And quite honestly, it all came together and it's a very playable instrument. I still have it. And it's, it's, it's a that's fun cool. guitar. To play. Best design in the world. Uh, that's to be said for that, you know, and uh, being a, a design student, you know, you learn to appreciate these things. You were a design um, student? Right. Yeah. Oh, Gravity design. Too. Nice. Yeah. Right. So yeah, we actually have a lot, kind of a freaky amount in cons common so far. A, oh. we're both on the internet right now. We both went to oh. art school. We're both into music. We're both from Orange County. Weird. Yeah. Um, we, yeah. Okay. So now that's you're uh, finishing each other's sentences. maybe twins separated at I, birth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So where's my guitar? <laughs> uh, okay. So let me ask you this: uh, You were talking about seeing those early, early guitars and stuff. What were the first, I guess, attractions, maybe brand-wise or model-wise? I know you just mentioned the, the uh, Strat, um, but the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, brand wise, like what, what was, what was kind of like really pulling you in yeah. at that time? Well, yeah, I mean, my exposure was really to what we call the, especially the boutique builders, we refer to like the big three, you know, so sure. like getting the, uh, the catalogs and the guitar magazines, you know, everything was about Gibson and Fender, yeah. um, Paul Reed Smith at the time. And, um, what happened, like once I, cause I'm actually a drummer, um, cause my dad's a drummer. So I grew up playing the drums. My brother was so good at guitar that it pushed me into playing the drums. So right. I was fascinated with guitars, but I, I played the drums. Um, but once I started playing guitar, cause it's a lot more portable than a drum set, you know, sure. um, I really got into like, uh, guys like Brian Setzer. Um, so his, his like Gretsch, like that hollow body, oh man, that was, uh, you know, just a beautiful, you know, design like that, that really intrigued me. Oh, sure. Yeah. You know, so stuff like that. Also, I, I got into, like I was saying with the pedals, instrumental surf. So kind of seeing some of the, you know, you see more of the Fender catalog, uh, there. Um, so those were the types of guitars that really caught my eye. And, and, um, I think kind of, you know, like you were talking about, like, that's what I gravitated towards. So the George Lynch tiger model. <laughs> 
That's, that's, uh, well, that's, that's the thing is, you know, having an appreciation of those. And, and you know, I knew what BC Rich were and, uh, you know, sure. the Kramers at the time. You know, I thought those were cool. But uh, like the type of music that my brother was into was a lot more of the technical, really fast kind of stuff. And, and my direction ended up being more like rockabilly, instrumental surf and then like like sloppy blues, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and so those were the those were the um, guitars that that I was more drawn to. But like I said, you know. I still appreciated all of them. Yeah. Floppy Blues, that's half of Tony's middle name. <laughs> <laughs> that's my new band name. And the name. other one ain't blues, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, great. Now, you got your influences. You are starting down the guitar path. Uh, right. How did you develop into the quality that you are doing now? Well, it... Like I said, it started with parts casters and, and, um, the curiosity, like my first guitar, part of me was hoping that I would fail just so that I could get it out of my head and be like, okay, I'm done with this. I tried it. It didn't work out. Move on. Try something else. But, uh, fortunately, unfortunately it worked out and, and I was just chomping at the bit to do the next one. And so did another parts caster, another, like kind of a, I did an SG style, like warmest, you know, um, build for my dad. And, um, I just wanted more. And each time, you know, you're thinking about taking it up a notch, like, okay, what's, what's the next step here? Um, doing the finish myself, you know, doing, um, cutting the body myself. And, you know, so each project was kind of, you know, a matter of, you know, taking on part of the, the build, uh, like buying the materials instead of buying the prefabricated part. And, um, and so once it got to where I was, making the necks and slotting the fretboards and, you know, doing all that kind of stuff, building the bodies, doing the finish on like Strat and Tele and even some like double cutaway, less Paul style builds. Um, you know, that was when I was also getting more like networked and more associated with other guitar builders. And, um, a lot of them encouraged me to kind of start finding my own path, you know, because when it came down to it, there are a lot of people out there, like, let's take the Telecaster, for example, another great design. Um, there are a lot of people out there making Telecasters and and no criticism to them. You know, they've got it down. Like (laughs) they're doing a great job. They're beautiful. And there's, there's no need for, for more of them out there. And, um, so one guy that I was talking to, he actually worked at reverb.com. It was at one of the NAM shows and we were just chatting and, and he said, so what would you build for yourself then if you could just, you know, make something that you wanted? Mm -hmm. And the, the first thing I designed was the, um, my Ashford model. So I took a kind of an offset, you know, like a jazz master type shape and then just freehand drew on on a piece of plexiglass, like I redrew some of the lines and I took, took some cues from like the, uh, like a 335 and then, you know, like some Gibson lines, some fender lines. And, um, that's I knew that a, I wanted a beautiful to... guitar, man. Yeah. By that kind of, that kind of oh, caught you. my, that kind of caught my eye as well when I was searching through your, thank your you. products. Yeah. So I wanted an offset waist, but I didn't want the the back end to be offset because I wanted to try with a tailpiece and, and stuff. So, you know, kind of redrawn the lines and all that. And it became this really fun build, the first one, um, because it was very organic. Like I deliberately didn't use templates for too much of it. I tried to freehand like route a lot of the stuff. I, for a long time, I called it the freehand guitar before mm-hmm. I came up with the the names. And, um, so that was getting some attention, you know, some really good feedback. Some of the other builders that, that I talked to, they gave me, um, you know, they recognized it and, and gave me some encouragement. And, uh, from there I kind of decided, well, um, you know, three is, is good. Three is like a nice, solid, you know, keep your, your menu, like, it, you know, Todd, you're from, uh, you know, something California, you know, the whole in and out thing. It's like, right. Th- there are three things on the menu. Essentially there's a whole hidden menu, but you know, yeah. really when it comes down to it, there's, there's beauty in the simplicity of your options. You don't so I want less... the Ashford animal style. That's what we're talking about. There you go. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So it's a matter of, um, you know, focusing it down because also as a custom builder, you get kind of all crazy requests. People like, Oh, I want to be like this color and this shape. And I want you to recreate this. And it's hard to turn that down. Um, if you don't have like some set principles and like, well, well, here's where I'm coming from. Right. So, uh, that was when I developed the other shapes, um, specifically, you know, to kind of fit, 
different uh, categories. So that's the the Rayburn was kind of taken from what I liked about um, the Telly or like the Epiphone Wilshire, you know, like some of these kind of themes, like visual themes. And also my belief is that, you know, we're conditioned to really appreciate a lot of these, you know, familiar lines. Yeah. Uh, so it was, it was a matter of trying to come up with like a nice, you know, no neck angle plank style, like, you know, something that could fit in a telly case type of guitar that's got, you know, bass model is like a single pickup, like just real stripped down and, and simplified. That's what the Rayburn is supposed to be. And then the one in the middle is the Devera. And so for that, I really wanted to kind of fuse what I loved about like, you know, surf guitars and blues guitars and stuff. So that's got that, that offset shape. Um, you I know, be- I believe and- it's pronounced the Devera. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I, I love doing that. To me. <laughs> uh, please go on. Just like sorry, you said. my yeah, I'm a doofus. <laughs> sorry. So anyway, that that's the one that like it's great with a Bigsby and yeah, you know, um, that's actually kind of a, a longer uh, body guitar uh, right. from from what it looks like in 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 the images that I've seen too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The intent was really to kind of bridge the gap between the Rayburn and then the Ashford being like the semi hollow, like, you know, that, that one is the most involved in, in terms of build standpoint. So the Devera was intended to sit in the middle visually, but also just the way that it's constructed. Cool. Uh, in terms of finishes, what kind of, I mean, what, what are, I'm assuming, are you using a, a lacquer or are you do, using poly or? Right. At the moment I'm doing lacquer. I've been experimenting with, um, some water-based lacquer. I've, I've had mixed results with that, but I'm, I'm trying not to give up on it. I really want to make that work because, um, trying to deal with, with nitro is, you know, it's, there, there's a lot that's uh, challenging with it in terms of, you know, just the fumes and the volatility and the, you know, the cleanup and the, all that kind of stuff. The problem is, is it's just such a beautiful finish in the end. So right now, Lacquer is, uh, the nitro lacquer is what works. Um, but I'd like to find something that is, you know, water-based, uh, you know, easier cleanup, less toxic, um, you know, and all that. Um, are you using the old school, uh, lacquer or the newer lacquer with the plasticizer and all that kind of thing? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. It's, um, right now I'm using Balin's, um, nitrocellulose lacquer, um, I'm not sure how – it's probably not that old school. I mean it's the stuff that you order nowadays. Yeah, it's what's available. I mean you know, the, some of the older stuff, of course, was a lot more volatile. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. could do not different EPA things friendly. with it. Yeah. Uh, but I, I have a lot of, uh, of companies that I work with, small builders, and, and a lot of them have switched over to um, uh, various uh, poly finishes that they, they're starting to – I think Polly has come a long way since the old days of, you know, basically dipping your guitar in the tank and, you know, (laughs) plastic coating it. Um, Well, yeah. um, Like Doug Cower, he's, he's been a a, a good friend in the industry and and he's, he's helped me out a lot. He's like a mentor. Um, He does, he's really great. uh, It's like UV cured um, finishes in their poly. So it goes on really thin. It's not quite like that super chunky plastic look, but it's, it's a very durable, you know, very beautiful finish. Um, but he's set up for that, you know, he's got the right. booth and the, right. the, the, um, the UV oven or whatever they, they call it. It's just, you know, there's, there's a lot that goes to that process. And, a lot and more so efficient, I imagine on a turnaround too. With it, yep. with if you're well, yeah, it once UV, a poly yeah. finish sets up, I mean, you yeah. basically take it into sanding and, and buffing and you're it. done. Yeah. So the challenge, is, the challenge has been like, you know, making it available to my customers, giving them the option. Quite honestly, uh, almost everybody asks for the nitro finish. You know, I've been trying to push like, hey, you know, would you like me to, uh, we can go poly on this, we can go nitro. And so far, everybody's asked for the nitro. Yeah, yeah. That seems to, I mean, I, I don't think that's uh, unusual because I think a lot of people, whether it's in their heads that, you know, I, it's got to have a, a nitro finish or whatever. I, I prefer, I, I prefer yeah. nitro finish. Well, the wood has myself. to breathe, man. You know, come on. Man. The <laughs> wood has to breathe. You can't suffer. It's a wood. Plastic. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh, as far as your builds go, I'm curious. Your, you know, your first one was the Ashford, which. <laughs> That's a pretty ambitious design. Yeah. It it looks it, it, the beauty of it, in my opinion, 
and here's where we're gonna do our wonder twin powers connecting on on <laughs> design mm -hmm. is that it doesn't look complicated but cool that's a carved top the hollow semi hollow that ain't easy right and it's it's not quite as involved as, as like a traditional arch top, you know, with the steam bent sides and the, and the curfing and all of that, the, the body of it was really taken as a, um, solid, you know, piece of mahogany that I, I kind of hollowed out the, the sides, but I left the center, um, solid. And then I took a maple top and, um, carved the top of it. And then I figured, well, I might as well carve the underside as well to match the top contour. Um, and so when I got it put together the, the first time, I thought, well, the back is still flat, but the top is curved. I might as well, you know, carve out the back as well. So that was um, it. It was one of those things that was kind of evolving as I was building it. Um, it like I said, the process was was really pretty organic. I mean, for every build that uh, I've done, other than that, I usually do like a mock up in Photoshop and get a clear picture of exactly as close as I can get exactly how the thing is going to look when it's done. Whereas this one, I didn't have any of that. Right. Um, oh, yeah. And so and it's I, piano black. So. <laughs> right. And that's a throwback to like the Gretsch, like, you know, one of the, the first ones I did, you know, it's, it's the one on my website. It's yeah, it was that black top with the natural mahogany back and sides with the cream binding, yeah, like it's the, uh, the old duo jets, you know, like those are so um, someday I'll, I'll own one. But until then, I, you know, I, I've got that Ashford. Yeah. Uh, as far as your headstock, I know that that is something that a lot of luthiers really struggle with. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, an, an ownable headstock is really what you end up owning that's the that's your trademark for the for the most part so uh, walk us through that sure exercise. no you're absolutely right and it's it's one of those things that uh, it it very much identifies the guitar even if you can't read the name on the headstock you know you're going to know it by the silhouette so for a long time I'd experimented with some six in line headstocks, but I couldn't get past, you know, the stuff that I liked had already been done. And, and the hard part is you move some lines, you, you know, you change the points around and it's like, you think you got something original and, and sure enough, you see someone has already done it. So the, the hard part was not like, like deliberately copying someone else. It was unintentionally copying someone else. Like it was really challenging just for me at least. Um, whereas the three by three thing, that shape was just, you know, one of several little things I was sketching out and I liked it on paper. And, and so I started working with it and started to get some good feedback. So that kind of became the thing. And, um, all three of them are slightly different. When I do a Rayburn, it's a little narrower version of that up to the Ashford, which is bigger and wider to kind of match the, the larger body style. But yeah, um, going forward, um, that's, that's the headstock that I'm, I'm using on all of them. Oh, interesting. Yeah. That's uh, it, you have it's well, it's a very simple, simple design, and uh, I love the painted back too. I, I'm a fan of that. <laughs> Thanks. The, the old stinger look. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Nice detail with that going right down the neck too. Very and classy. Yeah, one of my uh, most prized guitars was a was a gift. It's um, a Gretsch Tennessee Rose, and and on the the neck, it's got that laminated center stripe in there. Um, so when I started doing necks and talking to other builders, they were talking about the the benefits of laminating it. You know, the the neck, because uh, I had been doing some like one piece necks. I I do a scarf joint for the headstock, but as far as you know, like laterally down the neck, like laminating two pieces together, and I thought, well. While I'm at it, I might as well put this nice black veneer between there and have this great pinstripe. And there's a benefit to the construction side of it because you've got a center line that is a permanent part of the neck. So when you're trying to align the scarf joint for the headstock and, and what I'm talking about there is you to get an 11 degree angle um, – for the headstock to tilt back, I actually cut that piece off at 11 degrees, flip it around and glue it back on. Mm -hmm. So to line up those two pieces on both sides, like the front and the back of the neck, also when it meets the body, like making sure that the center line is, is, you know, continuously running through the body on the front and on the back of the guitar, it's, it's a lot easier when you have that on there, um, or in there, I should say. And then when you're shaping the neck, like there were times where, you know, you draw a center line, but you're taking wood away and you sand it off and it's like redraw the center line. And so it's yeah. nice when it's built in. So, um, and it looks cool too, I it think. Does. So, yeah. 
What, what kind of uh, what kind of hardware do you do you normally use? Normally on like the Rayburns, I'm a big fan of this um, cut Tele bridge. So um, for the most part, I've been using a Wilkinson. Uh, it's got brass saddles and it's nice because you can string it through the top. Again, the, the Rayburn was all about simplicity. And, and I've done some kind of Tele style builds where it strings through the body. Um, but that's more holes to drill. It's more to like deal with when you're doing the finish on the back because you got the ferrules, you know, to account right, for. Right. Um, so on that one, I really wanted the back to just be nothing. There's no plate, you know, it's just where the, um, where the screws mount for the neck. Um, so I had also taken a tour at one point through the Finner custom shop and one of the builders there was telling me how much he prefers the string through the top because of tonal properties and, and all that. Uh, in my case, it's more convenience. So the, that bridge, I really prefer. Um, I think there's a, an argument as equally uh heated with mm -hmm. the string through body as to tone wood it's there's so yeah <laughs> there are these there are those arguments out there that are just, like okay top three tone wood string through body and uh capacitors yep <laughs> and all and, uh, completely I negligible neck joint to that too <laughs> yeah yeah true true how about as far as tuning machines and things like that? What do you? I like? was gonna ask that. Oh, go ahead and ask it, Jared. Go ahead, Jared. What about the tuners? <laughs> uh, for the the fixed bridge, um, I, I really like the look of the clues on, um, you know, kind of the vintage like oval style knob. Yeah. Um, the the headstock it goes well with, uh, I've done some Grover shapes. Um, also the, uh, the kind of the Gibson style, like the tulips look really cool with it. Yeah. The perloid uh, tulips. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, so if it's got a Bigsby on it, I like to do locking tuners if I can. So I try to get the vintage, um, looking locking style tuners. The, the kind that they, uh, you feed the three, the string through the, uh, the hole on the stem or whatever you call that. And then right. when you when you start to tune, uh, the, there's a, like an inner shaft that pinches that string right there, right? That just locks it. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. That. So like the aesthetic, I still want to keep to some of the classic forms. Um, and if it's got some modern function, that's great. But um, if if the function can exist like at a more hidden level, that makes me real happy. Yeah. I when I first saw those, I I was impressed how hidden that function actually was. Mm -hmm. I don't like them. <laughs> I'll just say it. I don't like them. Do you like them? I hate locking tuners. You just hate locking tuners? I hate them. I've taken them off two guitars, but only because I, I'm at my familiar, they were gigging guitars. I'm like, I know it in theory, that's stupid because it makes more sense for it, a gigging it really, guitar. For a string change, yeah. It, 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 it does. I understand that. But I was also like, hey, look, if, I, if I'm if i futzing around with this on stage, I just I don't even want to deal with it. I've always had better luck with locking tuners, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. I wouldn't. I, I, I would probably actually, in retrospect, um, I would consider putting those on my um, my telly. The, the one I use for the for the Johnny Clash stuff because I usually end up bringing a second guitar because I'm like I, I can't change this I don't you know because I don't have a guitar tech <laughs> <laughs> I so, thought you said you were gonna hire me yeah. to be a guitar tech hey give me yeah. give me uh give me seven minutes I'm gonna change this string. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so uh, back to the locking tuners because, yeah let's, uh, I, I've I've stated my case but do you find uh, with a Bigsby especially that that there are some uh, improvements in terms of what are tuning? the advantages what are the advantages thank you you're welcome advantage well yeah it's it's tough i mean if it were my own personal thing i, I would just leave it as simple as possible you know a lot of that stuff is, is kind of upon request uh so like a roller bridge with locking tuners to try to minimize the um like you know any sort of friction points or you know the strings slipping out of tune um, now I do like the the rolling bridge with the Bigsby, right? Roller bridges. I think there there is a difference. I, it's just I, I don't know. Don't listen to me. I'm just I'm just old school. <laughs> I'm an old guy that likes old Cluzons. <laughs> That's another big argument. The uh, you know uh, a roller versus uh, you know uh, the little teeny rollers yes. versus uh, the, rollers? The, the the wedges. 
right? And it's like, oh, you you know, you lose all your sustain if you have a roll. It's like there are certain things that are like really, really core to me, in my opinion, like, you know, some things that I wouldn't bend on, like maybe some color combinations or trying to stick to the visual design of things and, and, you know, keeping the function simple. Um, but when it comes to the type of rollers and all, I mean, I'll make some recommendations, but something like that, uh, it's not a hill I want to die on, I guess. Yeah. You know, if, if they want if it's it, a matter you of, do it then. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. They pay but it, the money. <laughs> well, and the last thing I want to do is have somebody you know, contact me after getting their guitar saying it just won't stay in tune, you know? So it's like, right. there's the side of it, like trying to remove any variables, um, of, of it happening. So if I can, if I can put my mind at ease and their mind at ease with, um, a roller bridge and some locking tuners, you know, I, it's okay for, as far right. as I'm concerned. What's your favorite part of the build? Ooh, good question. Uh, the, the, like, carving like the woodwork carving like getting in there with a a rasp or a spoke shave and and really just you know scooping away you know strips of uh of wood cool what's your least favorite oh right now it's definitely the finishing Uh, (laughs) it is locking tuners (laughs) especially this because one of the guitars i'm working on is white and, um, you know, I'm, my shop is really, it's based in my home. So, um, I don't have like the formal setup, you know, and, and any random stray bit of dust. And I, I built like a booth like for myself, but even still, you know, it's like any random thing that's floating through the air will find its way <laughs> into mm-hmm. that. Oh yeah. And, yeah. And there's just no hiding it. And, and it feels like not just two steps forward, one step back, but like two steps forward and one and three quarter steps back. It's like, it just, it's the progress just comes to a grinding halt because you got to go chase out some speck of dust with sandpaper, you know? Mm. Uh, what? So that's the most infuriating part. I, I wanted to get your perspective on, uh, on one hand, uh, I understand why the, the desire to do something all yourself. Yeah. I am a, victim of that myself uh but i know my limitations and where i'm like hey look i can spend 10 hours to do this poorly or mediumly <laughs> that's a new word or <laughs> yeah, i can like get or, or i can get this done real quick real well yeah. my question is this is something that i hear from a, from you know a lot of luthiers which is i'm doing my own finishing and this is the biggest hassle of the entire process and the most and the biggest time suck and i have to redo it all the time so from you uh, from your perspective what is what is keeping you from having it finished there have been some that i've sent out for sure um before I, I was doing the, these three specific shapes, like um, one guy wanted kind of a less paul style but he wanted like a gold top and so that um went out to a guy that does like automotive finishes and and he did a great job. He'd done guitars too in the past. This wasn't like his first guitar, but, um, so that was great. The problem with that though, is it took an extra like three months, um, just for that step in the process. So because it's time off of my cue, it's also time added onto theirs. So it kind of depends on, on whom I'm sending it to. Um, but in my mind, it's about setting realistic expectations up front, you know, like, like coming from the kind of the freelance graphic design realm, when, when a customer and I, uh, sort out a guitar, we, it's, it's treated almost like a design project where there's, there's a, a proof that you know gets approved and we sign off on it before it goes into production and, and everything's laid out. So as far as the finish goes, um, for me, I try to present options up front. So Um, you know, this white one, for example, I'm learning if they want white again, I may just insist that that goes out, but you know, we we work that into the deal. If, if the, if the timing and the cost works out to send it out for the finish, then we'll do that. Um, there are, are finishes that I'm fully confident that I can do really well, um, in my place. I've done a French polish on, um, one guitar that looked really cool. Um, you know, natural finishes like, uh, can you, can you describe a French polish? Sure. Uh, French polish is, is, a it's a real old world kind of method where you're hand applying uh, shellac, which is a like, more natural. Like they do it with violin. Like a violin. Right? Yeah. 
Right. It, it's like a, it comes from a beetle. Um, it's, uh, it's like some secretion from a beetle or something like that. But um, you apply it like by hand with a rag in these small, tight little figure eights. And, and you just slowly build up the finish wow. by applying it by hand over and over. But it looks fantastic. I mean, it's really beautiful. And, you know, you talk about a thin finish with a, you know, a nice luster to it. Um, so there are different options, but it's a matter of setting expectations that, you know, okay, if you want me to do this, um, it'll take this much time and it'll cost this much. If, if you want some crazy, um, you know, like metal flake, cool two tone, whatever finish, then that's not something (laughs) <laughs> that's not something I could do myself. I'd have to send that out. So then we'd have to build that into the, the, the like friends. a scope of work type of right. thing. You well, know? you're, you're really fortunate that you have some really good finishers out in California. Oh yeah. I mean, that there's can, loads of them. Yeah. They can right. do that kind of work for you here in Ohio. Not so much. The entire city of Anaheim is basically auto painters and finishers. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that and Earl, surrounding areas. Isn't that where Earl Scheib is from? <laughs> <laughs> no, not, that's not knocking it. I love. I, I, I'm no, from I, there. I, I can I, say. I that. will say <laughs> that the uh, some of the best guitar finishers that I know have their roots in in painting cars. Yeah, I mean that's that's without a doubt. Yeah. Yeah, the guy I I have work done for me. He he matches uh, paint. That, that people want through car colors and he uses car colors so he's he's all he, he has a few uh, auto shops on call so right. i think a lot of good finishers have relationships with auto shops well that's how we got a lot of the colors like pelham blue and shoreline gold you know those were all automotive colors back in the day oh absolutely yeah so moving forward so you, you you've you've got this down to um, you know, how, so how many years have you been, I guess, solidly doing this? The last maybe two years is when I really developed like the Equids Guitars brand. I did the three designs and, you know, went forward with that more full force. It's not a full-time job, uh, at this point, but, um, that was when I really locked in, but I had been building the parts casters and, and, and all that for several years before that. Uh, do you, are you seeing evolution in your future asking the uh, eight ball <laughs> <laughs> in terms of what like oh, just what like are you gonna stay with this or are you gonna be are you gonna evolve your designs or get new ones or sure yeah there are a few designs that i'm sitting on um that i just don't want to get too far ahead of things right now you know sure. it, the um the pace right now is, is very nice. Um, uh, once I'm done with this batch, there's another batch, uh, ahead of it. And, and I've kind of closed the, uh, the orders, so to speak until that batch is done. Um, that was something that I learned kind of the hard way instead of working on them all like longitudinally, it was to, to batch them together in groups. So when somebody inquires, you know, um, if they need to wait, you know, I have to ask them to, you know, this is great. Let's work on the design. Let's get the concept together. And then I'll start on it as soon as I'm done with this batch that I'm at now. Right. Um, so in terms of evolution, like it would be great to, to scale up, you know, like the, the yield, like to, to be able to do more per batch. Um, but not so much that, you know, anything has to suffer or that they take longer because I, I, I'm doing, you know, five at a time instead of three or four. Um, so it, yeah. In, in that sense, uh, it's, it's a matter of like, I guess like slow and steady, you know, progress, but I'm not trying to really hit the gas and, and, and go super crazy. Um, right. there's a, a base prototype that I'm working on right now. That's based off of the Devera model. Um, so I've, I've got it kind of worked out like that one is, is, almost into the finishing process, but it's not necessarily part of this batch that I'm working on. So there are little kind of pet projects that I fit into the cracks. Um, there's some other ideas that I've got kind of simmering around with some other folks for like, you know, baritone, bass six, um, you know, some other, um, formats that it would be great to get into. Um, but from like a brand perspective, you know, I'm really just trying to build, um, some familiarity with what I have at the moment and and really kind of lock in and focus on that. That Devera really lends itself to a base. Just the, the, I I can totally hundred percent see that body as a base. 
Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. I'm really excited. Um, the the prototype is really a proof of concept for um, the guy that I've been working with that he wanted a, like a, a pretty elaborate base. And so um, we settled on a more simplified model and he was like, well, I'd, I'd like to see it and try it first. And I said, yeah, so would I. So um, so building that out, uh, looking forward to be done with that. I, I'm really going to have fun with that base, I think. That's cool. That's cool. OK, so here's the um, here's the, the maybe the funnest question you get to answer. Uh, you've got a couple of your guitars and you got to get them in the hands of anybody that you want to play them. Who are they? Mm, that's a good question. You know, cause being close to the, the NAM show, it's something I've been fortunate to attend for several years now. And you see a lot of the same people walk around and some of them I've talked to like, Hey, I build guitars and they're like, Oh, cool. But the, you know, some other big company is paying them a fortune or probably throwing free guitars at them, you know? So when you talk about like, um, you know, somebody famous, that's actually less appealing to me. Um, because in my mind, I'd want someone who believes in, in what I'm doing enough to like actually pay for one, <laughs> you know? Like, oh yeah. I, uh, uh, let's say they did pay for it. Right. Exactly. So, um, <laughs> there's uh, take, take that out of the equation. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> right. They will be well, paying because, they well, pay there are retail that, price. There are a lot of people that I talk to that, oh, if you could just get some famous person to play them, it would be this and that. And it's like, yeah, that's not really what I'm interested in. Um, so they're like, you know, some studio musicians or things like that would be great. Um, we just went to my wife and I went to a concert. We saw um, this. He's a singer songwriter, real bluesy, rootsy kind of style. His name is Patrick Sweeney. Um I've been following his music for a long time. I really enjoy it. And um, so watching him play, you know, I was standing there going, oh, man if I could put one of my guitars in his hands, like, you know, the, the type of music he's singing and playing just kind of, it's like you got that itch in your ear that like only someone will scratch it the right way. And, and that, you know, his style was, was really in line with, um, you know, what I enjoy. So which model? That's a, that's a good question. It, uh, an Ashford or a Rayburn. Cause he was playing, um, he was playing some tellies and he also had one of those offset strats, um, with the kind of the jazz master pickups and the F hole. So, um, I could picture him rocking a, a Rayburn or an Ashford. I mean, would you be excited if, you know, Jimmy Page called you on the <laughs> oh, phone? He's wearing a Jimmy said, Page shirt. Hello, love. There would you send over one of those lovely guitars? I want an Ashford. I'd like an Ashford and something in black. That's right. <laughs> and gold hardware. Would, how would you of feel? Course. He, he just, he just, he just told us. But Jimmy of course. Page. Well, <laughs> what it comes down to is, you know, it's like for the hours that it takes, you know, to, to build one of these and same with you, you know, the, you know, your pickups and your, your pick guards and stuff. like you want the thing to be played. You want it to be enjoyed. You want it to hopefully be handed down to the next generation. Um, so yeah, if, if any of these people were going to genuinely play and enjoy the guitar, of course, I'd love to put it in their hands. But if it, if it was a matter of like, somebody wanted it for their wall and, uh, you know, or it's going to like hide out in a case somewhere like, yeah, th nope. that would be as, you know, that's where I guess more of the, the artist side comes into it. It's like, no, you want, you want this thing to be played Wait. and enjoyed. And that's, what's crazy about guitars is, is it's, it's a, it's an art form for the people who build them, but you're handing it over to another artist. And what you, you know, what they do with the art that you made is part of their art, you know, and you just want it to kind of go forward that way. Um, like for example, my brother, he's a really, really good guitar player. And growing up, it was like, man, why can't I play like he does? But watching him play like he does on a guitar that I built for him feels better than being able to play like he does. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like finding your, your, your space. And it's like, okay, so Maybe I'm not intended to be the world's best guitar player, but if I could make a tool for the other great guitar players, then that is like super fulfilling. That's so, really well put. Because so I, if I Jimmy Page, way. you know, wanted to play one, yeah, of course. Would you consider uh, a guitar with opposing necks for Michelangelo? <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> I can't believe you uttered no, that name. No, on this show. no, you were, that was really well put, and I get the same feeling when I. If I sell my product to somebody and, and and see the result of that with my eyes live, that's the ultimate satisfaction. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, thank you so much for sharing, uh, you know, your world with us. Of course. Every time I see a, a guitar that interests me or that is like something, some new thing, 
there is a huge part of me that's going like, please just let's build one, please just let's build one. And then I have to, I'm just like, you know what? I'm going to let other people do that, and I'm going to appreciate the hell out of them. That's yeah. so that's why I'm going to do it. <laughs> yes. So, all right. Excellent. Knock that one out of the park. Thanks, buddy. Um, <laughs> I think we have we have something to say. Yeah. So, would you rather... You almost forgot to do it. No. <laughs> you did. You always say, and now it's time for. Right, I threw you off. I like it. All right. That's I, what I've been I, waiting I, for. I like the so introduction. That was nice. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so this week's would you rather, would you rather have, would you rather have. That's four. I didn't know it's would you rather. <laughs> but would you rather. I can't say it without saying it. <laughs> okay. Would you want Keefe's? <laughs> I said want that time. Okay. Okay, Keefe's Telecaster with the what the big E's missing, right? The natural. Yeah, or, the five string. Or would you rather have a Macabre. Junior. The TV, TVLO Junior. Oh, yeah. Which one are you taking? And he, he has one in one hand, one in the other. He says one in the other, dude. Which one are you taking? Do so I go first? Is that no? You've been you take a, take a break, get some water, you know, <laughs> yeah. rest your rest your your cords. Listen to me, Tony. My words, macabre. Yeah. I take macabre. The macabre. What's the mac- what? that's his Telecaster? Okay. Yeah, I'm just clarifying. I, I I would take that. That to me, even more so than the Les Paul Junior, is. I mean, plain and simple. I, I mean, every every time that I have seen the Rolling Stones, it's been a telecaster of some sort right and to me that that so that's it i'm taking that one i like the video where the guy runs up on stage and then he oh. takes the telly off <laughs> <laughs> he, maybe that that's the one with so the missing east that, right? that could be one. Well, no you know <laughs> there is you know he does play a five string yeah, a lot of them he sets them up like that I mean, yeah because yeah. he just he finds the the low e irrelevant apparently yeah. anyways okay thanks tony that's the one i want all right i'm Jared? sticking to it well, that's tough. Kevin. <laughs> I go with the junior. <laughs> you go with the junior? Yeah. There was uh, one moment I had at a guitar center one time where it was TV yellow. It was one of those juniors, and it was so simple. You know, the one pickup and everything, and it just clicked, man. It just seemed like it was pulling better playing out of me, like stuff I normally struggle with. It was like just happening on this one, and it felt fantastic, and I wasn't able to buy it at the time and, you know, missed it. So, yeah, I, I think – and and that's um, that's kind of like some of the builds I don't do anymore. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, that style, that shape, is that's part of that simplicity, you know. Uh, I'd go that It's one of your designs too, I mean, it, it seems like. Yeah, it's in there. Yeah, for sure. Okay, can I go now? <laughs> yeah. All right. Now it, it's tough because no, I'm gonna give the the junior credit because I like the neck profiles on those '50s juniors. However, I am gonna take the telly and I'm gonna fix the low E on it. I'm gonna have it fixed. Sacrilege, man! Why you can't do, just do? Do you it. know a place that could do that kind of work? Nobody would. <laughs> I think right. up in uh, Akron. Ohio, Nobody would. They'd kick you straight out of the store. Well, he's guitar repair. Oh, no, my gosh. <laughs> no, Dan wouldn't do it. He'd say, are you nuts? Don't Seriously, oh, I'm I, we're, I'm collecting. I'm going to start collecting. Yeah. Um. Okay. What about you, Todd? What do you think? Oh, yeah, what which would you see, take? Okay, it's hard because I, I really love, as Kevin was saying, the simplicity of it, of, of the junior. I, I, I really do. I am more a fan of the cutaway, the double cut. And I love playing my telly and I love playing it like a two by four. It's just it's a blunt and I play it like a blunt instrument. And I feel like he he does too. He's got a little bit of extra he's his own finesse that he puts on it. But it's it's he plays in a primal way and I love that. And so I you got I gotta go with the telly for sure. All right. Yeah. And Primal. he'll use it as a baseball bat to keep people. Yeah, on don't stage. go. Yeah. Do not approach. Keep on stage. <laughs> All righty. Well, we made it through, everybody. 
Uh, I mean, we didn't make it through everybody, but we made it through, comma, oh every, punctuation <laughs> is everything, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Don't forget your commas. Uh, I just need to uh, uh, call out a few people who have been helping us out quite a they bit. Get their name right on. Yep, so. our executive producers, Tom Barazin, Martin Cliff, David Wolfson, Matt Brammer, Carlos Mancha, yes. Pete yep. Marshall, Derek Fitzer. And Robin Smith, thank you guys so much for your support. Thank you. It means a lot to us. And if you would like to become an executive producer and... Get your name right on the thing. Uh, head, o- <laughs> head over to patreon.com forward slash the guitar knobs and find out how. So thank you so much, Kevin. We appreciate your time. We appreciate your artistic vision and your effort and the passion that you put in your product. And hopefully we'll cross one. We'll, we'll, we'll maybe get to pick one of those up someday. Where can we find them at, Kev? Um, well, right now I'm, I'm just dealing direct. And um, But like I mentioned, my friend Co Schneider, he's um, put together this cool road show. Um, he lives in the San Diego area, and it's called the One Day Show because within a uh, one day's drive radius of San Diego, he loads up a van with all kinds of you know boutique guitars and um effects and all that kind of stuff and and drives out to um some like predetermined like rehearsal studios he's done um it, it just kind of sets up like a pop-up boutique um so usually have um at least one or two of my guitars with him um i had a few out at the nam show um in another booth just kind of as demo guitars so we'll see if i can line that up again this year are you guys coming out to nam i may be going out in january maybe i will not but okay um, hopefully we're going to try to get out to the, to the Nashville one. What's your website? Yeehaw. Uh, my website is equitsguitars.com. Where can they find you socially? Socially is at equits guitars, E Q U I T Z. Cool. Excellent. All righty. Uh, Hey fellas, where can we find you guys? Well, if you guys need some pickup work done or a custom set of pickups, uh, find me at, brandonwoundpickups.com common spelling uh email jared what does that mean <laughs> common spelling b-r-a-n-d-o-n w-o-u-n-d we're not at oxford bro p-i-c-k-u-p-s rounded wounds wounds <laughs> dot com all right excellent and you're on you you reverb shop yes 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 brandon wound pickups on reverb yeah, we're gonna we're gonna bolster that a little bit, aren't we? We're gonna yeah. get some more pickups up there. Yep. And Tony, uh, Thursdays or Fridays, I'm usually here. Our knobs episode, so yes. you can find me here. You can find you here. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> if I mean, if you physically want to find uh-huh. me, I have the guitar. Knobs. Uh, but if you if you would like to, you can visit my website, hickguardian.com. Socially, hickguardian one. On both uh, Instagram, watch a boop. My gosh. <laughs> That's the this Italian like, pr- pronunciation. Yeah. Watch it. Watch it. Anyways, and, and hey, everybody, you know where to find us, uh, the Guitar Knobs, on all the socials and everything. And if you don't, go to theguitarknobs.com and find out how. Or just go there anyway, because there's stuff. And go to our Instagram and go to our Facebook group. Please go on there and share your guitar stuff. Say we love stuff. seeing new stuff and asking questions, and we like the word stuff. Subscribe! Yeah. yeah. Well, that's it for these knobs. Please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash the guitar knobs. Visit our website at theguitarknobs.com for all of our past episodes, four on the floor blog and other good stuff. You can connect with us on social too at our Facebook page and share your gear and stories on our Facebook group. Also, be sure to check out our Instagram at Guitar Knobs. Catch you next time.